obviously the father's job is to pull those instincts out of you. Yes. But he's not giving anything to you necessarily because there has to be the so a biological substrate in there that's receptive first of all. Yes. It's coming from you, your mm. capacity, your potential. Mm. So regardless if, if your father does it or not, it's still in you. Mm. And yes. other people can do oh, it. Oh, definitely. Yes, mm. we're, without a doubt. Welcome back, everybody, to Young to Live By and to the fourth episode in our Father Complex series. Now, of course, you don't have to have seen the previous ones, but of course, the general theory would help, I would have to say. And uh, you know, we've covered several things in this series so far, including a general case study, including uh, multiple cases of fathers or father figures confirming son or son-like figures, how that torch can be passed down through the generations. But what we haven't covered yet, and what's potentially the most significant variant of that you know, father-son dynamic, is what happens if either you don't have a father, or your father's dead, or your father's inadequate and can't confirm you. So I was wondering, of course, it's a, it's a broad question, but what both of you guys thought about that? Well, in the end, you have to self-confirm. Um, that's the hard truth of it. No matter how good or bad your own father has been, ultimately you have to be able to let go of that bond and to transcend it. Difficulties obviously arise when the attachment has been damaged in some way, which forces you to either continually repeat an attempted correction of that experience um, or get locked in a neurotic adaptation. So ultimately you have to free yourself from the father, no matter how good or bad that they have been. So you do have to self-confirm. Mm, okay. So, you know, if, if you're, you're growing up and your father does confirm you, I presume then in that case, because the instincts are all aligned, yeah. that naturally that attachment would go and you'd move on. That sounds to me what would be healthy to me. Yes, it's it's uh, it's the nuance, isn't it? Because it's what does the father give you that is a value for you to be able to move on or to to meet the necessity instinctively to move on. That's the essence of it. Other than that, you can have any kind of relationship you like with your father, but that's the the hidden thing. That's the thing that that's inside the father son or even father daughter relationship, which you need to be able to extract out of. That if you don't, there are going to be problems. And it boils down to confirmation. But confirmation is a rite of passage. It means you can leave the father once you have been confirmed by them. It doesn't mean you continue a childish uh, bond with your father where you infantilise yourself or the father himself infantilises you or abuses you or whatever it is that's keeping you bonded to the father. It's about moving away. Then you can have an adult relationship with your father, mm -hmm. an ordinary relationship without those instinctive inherited expectations not having been met because that's what causes the problems. Mm, that makes perfect sense. Makes, makes perfect sense. So you mm. say you've got to self-confirm. Yeah. That's a difficult thing to do. It is. It, it's a process dynamic. If, for example, your mother doesn't confirm you as a son, then the father can still mm. confirm you because he comes later down uh, those four stages. Uh, again, if the father doesn't confirm you, then a peer group is the usual option. Uh, finally, uh, in that four-stage model, it's going to be a mature adult relationship with a woman who would choose and confirm you as a life partner. Mm. That's the biological side of it. When we then get into the psychology of it, then that's purely individual and that's about self-confirming. Uh, and at that point, you're in the, the realm of what Jung called individuation. Mm. Okay. So, Pauline, from a woman's perspective mm. then, um, with, with, say, a father above any kind of woman, um, how would you self-confirm as a woman then? Probably the easiest thing for me to do is to actually say what happened for me to some extent with respect mm. to my own father. And if I think back to, I'd just finished my, my occupational therapy training and was ready to enter the world of work and obviously I'd spent uh, three years uh, working to achieve that um, with that goal in mind. So I was kind of already uh, underway with respect to finding I guess my own place in the world but unfortunately he he became ill during that time and at the point that I finished my training he was really terminally ill and I'd actually sought out some person-centered counseling unfortunately for me but but it was just uh, at the time it was a means to an end it was all that was available and I was encouraged to write a letter to him 
and not even to give it to him, but just basically put it in the post and let him have it and to just sort of say exactly how I felt about things, how inadequate he'd been as a father, etc, etc. And again, with the benefit of hindsight, I think that was probably a really, really awful, crass thing to do. But I did it nonetheless because that was the guidance that was available to me at the time. And I can remember having a conversation with him about the fact that I completed my training and and he, he already had a foot in the other world really so his attention wasn't on the outside world particularly but I at least wanted to communicate to him that I'd I'd, you know I'd passed the course and and I'd uh, I'd been awarded my diploma and I'd it was a an important uh, milestone and achievement for me and I was about to enter the world of work in a way that was significant for me I mean I'd worked before that but this was a a transition and um, therefore was particularly important and I can remember him saying to me, and this was in response to the letter that he received through the post, that, do you think maybe it's all been a bit too much for you? As in the training and therefore the capacity to go out and work on my own as an occupational therapist in the outside world. And he just kind of so widely missed the mark that I just, at that moment in time, I had to accept that he was never going to be adequate for the task mm. to confirm me in that way and as I think we've said in other videos that idea of the the father forming that bridge um, psychosocially for a, for a son or a daughter into the outside world mm. um, for me was missing with him um, and I had to carry on I had to carry on knowing that I was never going to get that from him but nonetheless succeed Um, And I think I did, because within a short space of time, I actually got a couple of very quick promotions, which was very nice and very confirming. But that confirmation came from from a peer group. It also came from a relationship with Steve, of course, Mm. because we were married at the time. Uh, And and he was and always has been and still is, you know, the most important man in my life. And so I thank God for that and for that experience. But... I think, as we said at the beginning um, of the video, that you have to find it elsewhere. You just have to do that. And it doesn't take away from the fact that you still have that potential within you to express mm. and, and to take forward. And there are, therefore, there are ways of self-confirming that don't rely on your own personal father. Um, and that's very freeing, really. And I think it's very encouraging and very hopeful for people mm. who haven't had a good experience. And that's probably, I was going to say most people actually, um, maybe it's not quite that bad, but uh, certainly a lot of people do have very poor or negative experiences of their father. Yeah, they do. It's just absolutely the case. Yes, they do. They do indeed. Yeah, self-confirmation um, is individuation, if you think about it. Mm. Uh at a psychological level, I have a, a view on individuation which is not conventional. Of course, most people will know that by now. That um, I regard it fundamentally as biological, and that the psychology rides on the unfolding lifespan that emerges from the genome. Um, if you focus only on your own psychology, then that is the most important thing there is. Obviously, because that's where you feel that you live and that. Uh, you're in there all the time and you're not engaging perhaps uh, socially, you're not attending to your biology, you're not attending to your instincts. That's um, not a particularly good way to live your life. You will drift away from your instincts and you will animate uh, the inner world in a way that perhaps it shouldn't be animated. And, and this is where some theories, some psychological theories can become pathological in and of themselves. So if you're exposed to a psychological model that puts all sorts of mythologized constructs into your head and say you must mediate through them in order to deal with the either devouring mother or the mother archetype or the father archetype and start slaying dragons and things, uh, you are divorced from reality. Yeah. The vast majority of people, the overwhelming majority of people individuate to their own capacity because of their biology and their engagement with the social world Mm -hmm. or the natural world. Mm. They do not need 
depth psychology in that sense they just unfold normally but when you um, put that particular uh, inflection on things you you generate further problems now in ordinary life ordinary lifespan development uh, adjusting to the psychology of your parents as young said himself is a fundamental task of separation it's very very difficult to have a psychology of your own whilst you're uh, still wrapped up in that primal relationship to to parents but but and this is this is the problem and this is little to do with psychology except as an afterthought your biology intends that you go through these stages of adaptation because without them our ancestors could not have survived so we do have to go through that primal imprinting onto our mother then onto our father then onto a peer group and then to a reproductive stage of life after which you can engage with psychology unfortunately though those early stages of adaptation are extremely important at an instinctive level and that means we can carry debris from that uh, and if that debris includes for a child that the father has not mediated between the child and the outside world sufficiently to explain it and to hand over the tools to deal with it, you're going to get a lot of neurosis, an awful lot of neurosis. So ultimately, when you separate from your father, that's through confirmation. It's a rite of passage. When you, as uh, you know, a young man, accept the sword from your father, the torch, however you want to uh, think of it, it is a separation. That's usually important. If, if that doesn't happen, you have to do it another way mm -hmm. because otherwise you're going to be attached to an unactualized instinct. And if you're told that that's an archetype, that's going to make it worse because archetypes are massively inductive, as you were saying, James. Yeah, well, I was going to say, maybe, maybe you should talk yeah. about that just for a minute. Yeah, this is, this, do, this yeah. is a practical thing I think everyone in the audience can notice. And you might notice it in a way, say, listening to yourself talk or any, or any, any of us speak. You can notice when you're focused and you can notice when you're sucked into something. Yeah. But uh, if something, something's engaging, you'll get sucked into it like a film or hopefully a video mm. like this one, of course. Um, but if you start reading about the devouring and the, the tyrannical father yeah. and the, the this side of culture that's represented by this alchemical symbol you can actually notice in real time you being sucked in yeah. that's you entering into a trance yes. if you pull back from it you're like oh hang on wait a minute that's just a bunch of nonsense. Yeah. So we were reading a book yeah. just before this. We won't say who it's, who it's by. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the same kind of thing, reading it. It's, it's by like, a, very fa a very famous British Jungian analyst. Yes, yeah. yeah. So obviously that brings status with it and mm -hmm. influence and power and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Mm. Which had a great interest to him. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, reading it now, especially having obviously worked with, with you two for a long time now, um, what a bunch of nonsense. Yeah. Absolute bunch of nonsense. To the point of, if you can detach yourself from how it can harm people, yeah. it's yes. actually fairly funny. Well, yeah. taken objectively. Adaptation to the social world is so important, mm. isn't it? Mm. And we've still got this um, leftover sort of confirmation bias from the Jungians that it's somehow better to be introverted and mm. introspective and it just simply isn't no. otherwise the role of the father wouldn't be as important as no. it is no. and, the, and the, there are good instinctive reasons for that as there well because it's obviously uh, safer for people to be in groups than it is to be on their own which is yeah. why when people lose significant Significant, significant people in their lives that that mm. that attachment that loss of attachment is so traumatic yeah. and so we're, we're, we're safer in groups and there's that instinctive pressure to belong and and to form groups and, and to be in social groups so yeah. I, I think we have to emphasize that yeah. really Steve mm. because yeah. it's um it, it's so overlooked and so uh, undervalued, really, yes. in young in circles. Oh, yeah, yeah, it is, it is. Yeah, anxiety seems to be often state-dependent on being alone. Yeah. So, so I say to people in, in, in consultations, they've got anxiety, and this is comforting for the individual to be like, are you anxious now? Yeah. And the normal response is no, mm. but I didn't notice. And it's like, that tells you everything. Mm. To disappear off into books and into your head and into la-la yeah. land, yeah. it's going to do nothing for you mm. at all. But, you, you know, you can, um, obviously you mentioned those four stages of development and how everything can, or how things can go wrong. So you can understand why people would fall into that kind of trap. <clears throat> but this may be a little bit crude, but to sum up everything you guys have said, there's more to life than just dad. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, um, the instincts are hugely important because they are all externally focused. 
all of them they're all about action in the world yes. every single one of them is orientated towards the, the outside world mm. everything every instinct that you have is about that if you're disengaged with your instincts you are going to introvert yourself in a pathological way mm. Mm. and then you'll get compensatory fantasies there are some people who are set that way and it's normal for them uh, it's not pathological to be very introverted but the problem with that is the lack of engagement with the social world uh, and that means also a lack of engagement with instinct if you're separated from that then the processing power of your cortex will start to generate fantasies and uh, belief in those fantasies and it becomes a virtual life instead of a real oh, life the ego fictions with that kind of stuff yeah yeah they become absolutely venomous they rip the yeah. person to shreds because yeah. an, an argument i've seen thrown around all the time is well if you're very introverted your role in the tribe is to pull out a good idea from the deep unconscious and it's like the chances you're going to have a life-changing idea like a cognitive idea yeah. is precisely zero yeah it's not going to happen. Unless you can make it real in the world in some form. Yeah, that's Through absolutely creativity. fine. Creativity. Yeah. Then it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Creativity is a yes. really, really good, good point. It is. That. Yeah. You know, being that philosopher who sits there on the mountain, mm. being a Nietzsche type, yeah. I've got an idea. It's like, but you went mad. Mm. Regardless of where, whether or not Nietzsche went mad for X, Y, Z reasons, it's not a role model you should be looking no. for no. at all. Well, creativity essentially is about novelty. And for the instincts then if you if you look at neuropsychoanalysis then that would be seeking to some extent mm -hmm. because it, it's the seeking system is engaged pretty much 24 7. Mm -hmm. it comes in, in a waveform an old trading waveform but it mm -hmm. kicks in it is absolutely real and it's about action in the world yeah. and uh, it's heightened in intuitives it's uh, yes and a lot of the guys mm. who watch us are probably intuitive types. absolutely yeah they, they they do have an over seeking they system do. Yes. Um, mm. yeah. sometimes it's internally directed which can be of value uh, where it's externally directed then it's probably easier not only to see mm. the intuition but to test it to pressure test it against reality mm. but when it's internally directed then it will animate and uh, the, the inner ruminations of the mind uh, fantasies and so forth and that can be a problem because that can replace your external orientation um, somebody who is is like the kind of person that you mentioned before, what value would they be to a tribe or a group? They would have to be a team player. They would have to be part of a group mm. of others who would be differently set yes. up. Others who would uh, act in an extroverted sensing uh, way on the world. Others who would act in a feeling way, using the Jungian framework. Yeah. Um, it would have to be a team effort. And of course that's what it means to be in a tribe or a group. Mm -hmm. um, if you abstract that person out of the tribe or the group and they become solitary, then it's pathological. Oh, yeah. mm. It has to be in service of the group overall. But like you say, Steve, with respect to the Jungian typology, mm. we have a suite of options. Yes, and we so do. And so the introvert intuitive can switch and use their intuition in the world as well if they, they, if they see it in that way can. and not they be can. limited by it. Yeah, that's, that's the problem of the theory. The theory it is. tends yeah. to suggest that you can't do that, but you can. It's just mm. a suite of options. You can choose to be whatever Jungian type you wish once you realise that you can. So just to double back to your story that you, you told, Pauline, mm. about it sounds to me like that's a moment. You know, you, you, you're, you're writing the letter and then he comes back to you and gives his, his feedback yeah. that we could call transcendent, meaning that there's something in there where it's like before and after you become a completely different person. Mm. I'm wondering how that feels on the inside, say, compared to previous times that you've tried to reach your own father like to try and find in that moment there is a feeling that you can grab and hold on to and say okay this is reality for how it is I think it was the realization that I was on my own I had mm. to make my own way in the world that I had to literally craft that for myself and any success or failure would be down to me Mm. It was it was my responsibility to either make it happen or not happen and to find, I guess, the confidence and the self-assertion, the self-belief to be able to do that. And I think, like I said at the time, I, obviously I was grateful for my relationship to Steve because had I not had that, I think it could have failed. Mm. I don't know if, it, if I'd have even made it to college, to be honest with you. I don't even know if it would have gone that far. So ultimately it helps to have 
you know, if it can't be your own father, to, to find it in some other way from some other person. We all probably have people that we either know or we don't know, but nonetheless we're inspired by them in some way. And so you, you, I think you have, to, you have to draw from those resources and that combined with your own innate potential, mm. make it happen. But it won't happen without that action in the world. No. Mm. That, that's an absolute baseline yeah it is, yeah, that, it is. That's, that's so promising as well because you're obviously the father's job is to pull those instincts out of you yes but he's not giving anything to you necessarily because there has to be the so a biological substrate in there that's receptive first of all yes. it's coming from you your mm. capacity your potential mm. so regardless if, if your father does it or not it's still in you mm. and, yes. and other people can do oh, it oh definitely yes mm. we're without a doubt but it's it's having that initial belief or enough of a belief, I think, in yourself to, to have a go at something, whatever that happens to be. It's not enough for it to be an idea no. or to read books about it yeah. or whatever. I, I think you have to take it out into life and make it literally manifest, make it happen mm. through you know your own ingenuity, the, the hand you've been dealt, whatever that happens to be. And... You get better at it, like anything. The more that you do it, the better at it you get, mm. regardless of what it is. But it is in the doing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The intense emotion that we all feel going through these adaptive phases is simply mm. because it's instinctive. Mm. Uh, and there is a biological, a genomic pressure on you to go through that process and it's that impetus that's why you feel the emotion and it's so overwhelming yeah. which we've you know we've yeah. gone through actually yes. uh, in, yeah. in some of the previous videos um so the intentionality yeah. for you to go through this process of separation uh, through confirmation is it's hugely important isn't it and also yes. the anticipation that if you're going to be a father yourself that you will do that for your own son yeah so what makes sense of all of that it is the genome only the genome can make sense of transgenerational experiences mm. in that way and that's why it's replicated that's why we keep going through it each generation goes through the same crisis of adaptation and identity and testing both of those against the reality of the world and why it's so powerfully uh, programmed in us emotionally because that's the impetus from the genome and from your instincts to make it real and to make it happen yeah just to come back to the emotional side of it again, Steve, because I may not have answered uh, James's question properly. Um, for me personally, the, the loss was paired with a sense of relief. Mm. But for me, it was like a, an obstacle had been removed, albeit, you know, a, a person, a human being. And I actually think it was like uh, having an impediment go. So whilst obviously it's not nice for anyone to lose their father, it was also an immense relief as well. And I think it can be that way with grief sometimes for some people, that it actually allows them to become themselves paradoxically yeah. when that person is, you know, literally out of the way that they can, they can flower and they can become themselves. Mm. As long as they don't do what um, myself actually... <clears throat> I've spoken mm. about opening on the channel and so many people that I speak mm. to and I know you guys speak to mm. and think that you're doing something for yourself mm. when actually you've just attached to another dad, mm. another yeah. character that comes along. It's, yes. it's, it, it's not unique to our age, but it seems to be more common in this it age. It is more common. Because it's so yeah. easy to, to access it. You know? Yes. And they're you know, pushed forward by the media or pushed forward by other it's people. True. Here's yes. our enlightened saviour who's going to lead us to the promised land. But it's like, yeah. no, you've just attached to him like he's your daddy. Yeah. And you're going to do everything because he's your daddy. Mm. So just, I guess, to put, just from, mm. from experience, to put that out as like a, a disclaimer, you know, to ensure that you, you have reached that, quote unquote, transcendent, but instinctual mm. in, in that way, mm. position, and you've not just latched onto somebody else because that's just going to keep perpetuating that cycle. And then another common thing people report to me in consultations is they jump from daddy to daddy to daddy to daddy to daddy. And then they come in complaining of all kinds of you know, anxiety, depression, that kind of thing. And it's like, yeah. you're not connected to yourself at all. You think you are. Mm. And it's not your fault at all. Yeah. But um, that's, a, a, that's a really good point. Yes, because yes. what self are we talking about? Yeah. Uh, and this is an issue I have with uh, psychoreductionism, as I call it, when people 
are persuaded that the contents of their conscious mind, what they know about themselves at any one time, is all that they are. Mm. If you ask someone to fall back on that, then you, you're asking them to fall back on a maladaptation because that's the state that they're in. Uh, if you ask them to fall back on instincts, then everything becomes clear because the instincts are absolutely clear and certain about what their intentionality is. It's also collective because we all have the same instincts. So that's the true collective unconscious it are the instincts and of course the genome that sits behind them. That will tell you what you need to do uh, without mythologizing anything, without adding extra layers of daddies that you mentioned mm. in the form of internet entrepreneurs and uh, manner personalities, all the suggestion that can come through that. Then of course you've got the problem that if you've had an abusive relationship, not just a disturbed one, but an abusive relationship from a father or a mother, um, that is a trauma which is amplified because it is one of your parents mm. or both of your parents that have, that have done that because they are such important primary relationships. So you can passively abuse someone by controlling them or not confirming them or you can do that and actively, physically, sexually, whatever it is, abuse mm -hmm. a child. Yeah. And that just makes the whole thing worse. The solution though in both cases is instincts. It's not to fall back on a wounded and damaged conscious personality that cannot cope, is overwhelmed, uh, and then you further burden it with theory. You, you need to get into that numinous, and it is a numinous okay. state of communion mm -hmm. with the transcendent, which is biological yes. in origin, because the ancestral spirits live in your genome, not in some yep. mysterious world outside of you. The in there, that's where the ancestral memory is, that's where the program is laid down of intentionality for you to have a, a confirmed and adapted life. So you need to go to your instincts. That's where your emotions start, that's where they come from. Uh, that's why you feel good when you're confirmed because the instincts say, yeah, you've got it right. And when they do that because you've got it wrong, you feel shit. It's down at that level. It's not in the fantasy compensatory world of so-called archetypes, it just isn't. And that's a huge, huge red pill that people need to swallow if they want to adapt. Because you can do it quickly if you do that. You really can. Yeah. And that's the difference. There's actually, this This is a quick aside, but uh, <laughs> you know the story of, of the Fisher King that we've yeah. spoken about before, you know, whom does the grail serve? Yeah. It's that question. That mimics DNA perfectly. It does, doesn't it? Because it's not your DNA. No. It's not yours. It's passed through you, and it will then be passed down to somebody else underneath you. Yeah. You're simply the vector through which it is expressed. And that's not to take away character or development or learning. That's all still built into it. It's not just dead matter and material in that sense. It's not. Con it's not constructive to think of it that way. But you know, that there's a guy we we all three of us have spoken to recently separately, um, and he was saying that it, it was the worst father story I personally have ever heard. I'm sure yes. I'm sure in your guys' yes. forty plus years experience, there's been you've heard uh, crazy stories, but uh, yeah, I was thinking to myself like, oh my good god, mm. like, just imagine just imagine the worst thing and then multiply it by ten. It's mm. like around there. Um, but he is far more of a man than most people I speak to. Not the father, mm. the young guy, mm. and of course he's he's got he's gone through so much hell and so much damage, but he I, he's someone I would call a man, mm. and I, I know he's got a, a very good relationship by his side as well, and it's like you did it, because you, human beings are malleable, they can they can take a lot of punishment and a lot of pain. Mm. That's the adaptive function we've evolved for that. Yeah. So regardless of the condition of the fathers that you guys have had you can you can still pull yourself through it and it's not to minimize the pain no. that you're going through whatsoever but it is to say you have evolved to adapt beyond that because you are far more than your father yeah. that's what i would say to that yeah. yeah absolutely well we may know the same person yes i think i know who you mean. yeah yeah we do <clears throat> we do yeah and i would i would confirm if you pardon the expression yes. what you've just said because mm. he's uh, he's an admirable individual um given what he he's been through and, and how he's, uh, he's stood yeah. up with great strength. That's uh, a version of the hero cycle, which we will be looking at as mm. well in, in a future podcast. To go back to what you said about the grail, um, the grail question as well, uh, the end of it, the end line is important as well. It's not uh, whom does the, the grail serve. Yeah, It's what is the secret of the grail. Yeah. 
uh, which is the first part of the question, but it's actually the final answer. And it is that you and the land are one. Yeah. The land is outside of you. Chills, it? It's outside of you. It is the world. You are meant to yes. act upon the world. And the reason that Arthur was in the state that he was in was because he withdrew from the world. Action in the world. And because he and the world were one, mm. the land decayed and became a wasteland because mm. it mirrored the waste on the inside. He was being asked to be extroverted, not introverted. Yeah. He had withdrawn in a schizoid sense. He had disengaged. <laughs> and he was asked to know, or to, you know, to understand what the secret of the grail was, which is that you and the land are one. And when he realised that, he woke up. And when he woke up, he could act in the world and he could individuate and fulfil his destiny. It's the real funny thing about those stories, and I was there as well with any of those things, but especially the Arthurian stories. Is as an introvert, I think I was attracted to them as like a proxy for living, and I expect to go there and find things that will confirm myself as I am, yeah, rather than uh, yeah. what I need to, to, to change. It's, it's more it's more akin to a myth where it will compensate for what you're looking for. Yeah. Otherwise, what's the point? It's just sort mm. of paddling around in a playground. Yeah. But so <laughs> with that interpretation, mm. it's like get out of your head. Well, yeah, it is. But remember, it, it opens with confirmation. The, the, the Arthurian story basically is about confirmation. And, uh, you know, you, you could you could look at it in a Joseph Campbell way and, and uh, the, the usual hero cycle way. Um, but, but it's not just that. There was a psychopomp in there in the form of Merlin as well who did mm -hmm. confirm him. And in some versions of the story, Merlin's actually his father. And there's all of the, these overlays which can you know, disguise what's really going on. But it's about somebody understanding their status. Becoming a king is an elevation in status from being an anonymous individual. Mm -hmm. So basically say, become yourself. Yeah, it's work through that process. But the final goal is understanding that the truth is in the outside world and relationship to the outside yep. world. And if you pull back from that, then the world will suffer and you will suffer as well. But this internal withdrawal and fantasy is not a good adaptation. Mm. And I'm an introvert, you're an introvert. Mm. Um, you might not believe it, but we are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's a hard lesson to learn. But those who don't, those who don't remain trapped in illusion and delusion. And if you want to have a mythological uh, analogue for that, then just, just look at Arthur and look at the role of uh, Morgan Le Fay and mm. how Merlin is beguiled and trapped by the negative anima, if you like. But he's he's entrapped in the inner world by her instead of action on the outer world, which is, was his proper function. So if she can pull him away from that, then all his strength and power goes, and Arthur mm. was the same. It's true for all of us. We're meant to act on the world. And when the world comes to life, yes. it hits you at the level of instincts, doesn't it? That's it where does. it impacts you it emotionally. Does. Yes. It just moves straight down. Yeah. And, and you and you react to it. Yeah, it's such a powerful image. Yeah, John Borman's Excalibur, the yes, movie, that one in particular. really shows yeah. that uh, when he sips from the Grail, Arthur, and he realizes that he that he didn't mm. know how empty he had been until he was filled. But that's something from the outside that's given to him that he ingests. Yeah. It's not on the inside. He has to be filled from something from the outside. Yeah. The Grail is it's just like a cup, literally. It's the medium of communication of something from outside to inside. And it was brought to him by a Grail Knight. He didn't win it himself. He was in this state of schizoid withdrawal. But as soon as he, 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 he figured out what he has to do uh, then everything changes doesn't it, it and does, he, he's yeah. uh, reconciled with his destiny that's uh, hugely important that myth in a very fundamental sense is much much older than the version of it that we have called the Arthurian cycle mm. and it's based on instinct the archetypes are just afterthought added on Thank you for watching this episode of Young to Live By. If you haven't already, make sure you download our free PDF for integrating your shadow. It includes the most advanced theory on the topic available anywhere on the internet, as well as a full practical breakdown. If you've ever wanted to integrate your shadow, this is honestly the way to do it. Thanks again for watching and take care.